Thank you for listening to our audiobooks. We do our best to regularly upload quality books with clear narrations. Please subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell icon so we can bring you more great books. Thank you very much and enjoy your audiobook. I would rather not go into any more details. The memory is too painful. Sufficient to say that after an eternity I got as far down the uterine tear as I could. Then we cleared away a lot of rubbish from the cow's abdomen and covered everything with antiseptic dusting powder. I stitched up the muscle and skin layers with the calf trying all the time to get in on the act. And at last, the thing was finished. Norman and I got to our feet very slowly like two old, old men. It took me a long time to straighten my back and I saw the young man rubbing tenderly at his lumbar region. Then, since we were both plastered with caked blood and filth, we began the slow process of scrubbing and scraping ourselves clean. Mr. Bushell left his position by the head and looked at the row of skin stitches. Nice, neat job, he said. And a grand calf, too. Yes, that was something. The little creature had dried off now and he was a beauty. His body swaying on unsteady legs, his wide-set eyes filled with gentle curiosity. But that neat job hid things I didn't dare think about. Antibiotics were still not in general use, but in any case I knew there was no hope for the cow. More as a gesture than anything else, I left the farmer some sulphur powders to give her three times a day. Then I got off the farm as quickly as I could. We drove away in silence. I rounded a couple of corners, then stopped the car under a tree and sank my head against the steering wheel. Oh, hell, I groaned. What a bloody balls up. Norman replied only with a long sigh, and I continued. Did you ever see such a performance? All that straw and dirt and ruminal mucking among that poor cow's bowels? Do you know what I was thinking towards the end? I was remembering the story of that human surgeon of olden times who left his hat inside his patient. It was as bad as that. I know. The student spoke in a strangled undertone. And it was all my fault. Oh, no, it wasn't, I replied. I made a right rollicks of the whole thing all by myself, and I tried to blame you because I got in a panic. I shouted and nagged at you, and I owe you an apology. Oh, no, no, yes, I do. I am supposed to be a qualified veterinary surgeon, and I did nearly everything wrong. I groaned again. And on top of everything, I behaved like an absolute shit towards you, and I'm sorry. You didn't. Really, you didn't. Anyway, Norman, I broke in, I'm going to thank you now. You were a tremendous help to me. You worked like a Trojan, and I'd have got nowhere at all without you. Let's go and have a pint. With the early evening sunshine filtering into the bar parlour of the village inn, we dropped into a quiet corner and pulled deeply at our beer glasses. We were both hot and weary, and there didn't seem to be anything more to say. It was Norman who broke the silence. Do you think that cow has any chance? I examined the cuts and punctures on my fingers for a moment. No, Norman. Peritonitis is inevitable. And I'm pretty sure I left a good-sized hole in her uterus. I shuddered and slapped my brow at the memory. I was sure I would never see Bella alive again. But first thing next morning, a morbid curiosity made me lift the phone to find out if she had survived so far. The buzz-buzz at the other end seemed to last a long time before Mr Bushell answered. Oh, it's Mr Harriet. Cows up and eating? He didn't sound surprised. It was several seconds before I was able to absorb his words. Doesn't she look a bit dull or uncomfortable? I asked huskily. Nay, nay, she's as bright as a cricket. Finished off a rack full of hay and I got a couple of gallons of milk from her. As in a dream, I heard his next question. When will you take them stitches out? Stitches? Oh, yes. I gave myself a shake. In a fortnight, Mr Bushell. In a fortnight. After the horrors of the first visit, I was glad Norman was with me when I removed the sutures. There was no swelling round the wound, and Bella chewed her cud happily as I snipped away. In a pen nearby, the calf gambled and kicked his feet in the air. I couldn't help asking. Has she shown any symptoms at all, Mr Bushell? Nay! Nee. The farmer shook his head slowly. She's been neither up nor down. 
You wouldn't know how it happened to her. That was the way it was at my first caesarean. Over the years, Bella went on to have eight more calves, normally and unaided. A miracle which I can still hardly believe. But Norman and I were not to know that. All we felt then was an elation, which was all the sweeter for being unexpected. As we drove away, I looked at the young man's smiling face. Well, Norman, I said, that's veterinary practice for you. You get a lot of nasty shocks, but some lovely surprises too. I've often heard of the wonderful resistance of the bovine peritoneum, and thank heavens it's true. The whole thing's marvellous, isn't it? He murmured dreamily. I can't describe the way I feel. My head seems to be full of quotations like, Where there is life, there's hope. Yes, indeed, I said. John Gay, isn't it? The sick man and the angel. Norman clapped his hands. Oh, well done. Let's see, I thought for a moment. How about... But twas a famous victory. Excellent, replied the young man. Southey, the Battle of Blenheim, I nodded. Quite correct. Here's a good one, the student said. Out of this nettle, danger, we pluck this flower, safety. Splendid, splendid, I replied. Shakespeare, Henry V. No, Henry IV. I opened my mouth to argue, but Norman held up a confident hand. It's no good, I'm right. And this time I do know what I'm talking about. Chapter 9 October the 30th, 1961 At 6.30am we reached the Kiel Canal. There was a little town at the western end and a big lock gate. We had to wait for about half an hour to get through the lock and during this time we took aboard a German policeman and a Dutch pilot. The policeman's job was to see that we did not pollute the canal by throwing out the manure and soiled bedding from the ship. He was very smart in a black leather coat with gold buttons and a neat blue uniform with two pips on the shoulder, and we spent a pleasant time chatting. He shamed me, as so many foreigners do, by speaking quite good English. After passing through the lock gate, it was a delight to be gliding along in still water for a change, and I stood out on the strip of deck watching the many types of vessels which used the canal. There were several German warships, and the young sailors with their little caps on the sides of their heads waved cheerily to me as they passed. The countryside was flat with much farmland and woods which looked very pretty with their autumn tints. We passed many villages with attractive houses, most of which had long, steeply sloping roofs and dormer windows. After about six hours, we arrived at the eastern end of the canal. Here, a German immigration official came aboard and stamped my passport. He also put a stamp on my name and the ship's articles, as this morning I was officially signed on as a member of the ship's company. It was odd to see the list of Danish names and then James Herriot, supercargo. I felt strangely uplifted. I had never been a supercargo before. The sheep looked quite happy this morning, though there was still that nagging cough among the Lincolns. The one with the eye irritation was almost normal now, but the lame sheep had not improved. In fact, it had deteriorated slightly and was running a high temperature. So I had got it in a pen on its own and given it a shot of penicillin as well as the antibiotic spray. Obviously the infection was deeper than I thought. The sailor who was my constant helper was the same one who spoke to me on the first evening. His name was Round, and he was a flaxen-haired young husky with great shoulders and a flattened, nosed boxer's face, but when he smiled, he radiated charm. He was warm-natured and an animal lover. When we had installed the lame sheep in its pen, he knelt down, put his arms round the woolly neck and gave it a long hug. I had noticed him doing this with the other sheep, particularly the massive Romney Marsh rams. As I have said, they were like huge teddy bears, and Round seemed to find them irresistible. Anyway, I was delighted they had chosen such a man to be my assistant. At the east end, the canal widened out into the Baltic. I could see the town of Kiel just round the corner, and there was a tremendous amount of shipping. We passed an imposing memorial to the Germans killed in the First World War, and there were a few deserted sandy beaches with summer houses around them. As we headed out into the sea, I found a hidden corner of the deck and did a bit of hopping about and running on the spot. I tried to make a habit of this because the only exercise I got was clambering up and down the ladders to the hold, and I had to work off Nielsen's abundant fare somehow. 
I had decided to make a final inspection of the animals each night at ten o'clock and go round them with Ran to hold any I wanted to examine more closely. On this night I was told that Ran was steering, but that if I went up on the bridge he would soon be relieved. The ship was pitching wildly as I staggered out onto the upper deck. This, I thought, was the real thing as I felt my way along in the inky blackness, drenched with sea spray, the boards heaving and slippery under my feet, my hands grabbing at anything to hold me upright. I stumbled onto the bridge and found myself in a decidedly eerie atmosphere. The bridge was an entirely different place at night, absolutely dark, and I had to stand there for a long time before I could pick out the lonely figure at the wheel. That was a quiet job, if ever there was one. When Ran came down with me, I gave the ewe with the eye trouble what ought to have been its final application of ointment and injected the lame sheep again. The animals which tried to stand were swaying and tumbling around, but they didn't seem any the worse. However, I wondered what they would be like in the morning because Ran told me he had heard the captain say there was a real storm blowing up. No matter, the big sailor said cheerfully. You come and have a beer with me. OK, thanks, I replied, and we went together to the crew's mess room. We sat down and he gave me a camel cigarette, and as we talked I looked around at the other members of the crew. Strangely, though the officers were dark, these were all of a type. Thick, yellow hair, fine physiques, tremendous men. All of them were cheerful and polite. Round, in his limited English, told me about himself. He was twenty-eight, had been at sea for fourteen years and was married with two young children. He never stopped smiling, except at the end when he leant across the table and tapped me on the chest. Doctor, on my last voyage we take two hundred cattle from Dublin to Lubeck. When we get to Lubeck, five cattle's dead. I whistled. That's nasty. Didn't they have a vet with them? No, no. His battered face was very serious. No doctor for the cattles. It's good that you are here for the sheeps. It made me think. Maybe I really was going to earn my keep. I thanked him, said good night to everybody, and made my way back to my quarters. Just outside my cabin was a door which opened onto a small platform on the stern of the ship. I liked to go out there for a lungful of good air before going to bed. That night, in the roaring wind, I could see only the creamy wash from the ship's propellers disappearing into the surrounding blackness. Above, there were a million stars, and I could pick out the plough and the pole star plainly. I didn't have to be an expert navigator to find our course. We were heading dead east. It was difficult to write my log that night because the cabin kept tilting steeply. The captain was going to be right about the storm. Chapter 10 To any conscientious veterinary surgeon, killing a patient is a terrible thought. I'm not talking about euthanasia, which is so often merciful, but of inadvertently killing when attempting to cure. This has probably happened to many of us, and I think it happened to me. I can never be sure, but the memory still haunts me. It all started when a young representative from a pharmaceutical company called at the surgery and started to talk about a wonderful new treatment for foul of the foot in cattle. This condition was a headache in those early days. Judging by its name, it had been going on for centuries, and it happened when the interdigital space between the cleats of the cloven-footed bovine was invaded by the organism Fusiformis necrophorus, usually through some small wound or abrasion. This resulted in the actual death of an area of tissue in the region, along with swelling of the foot and extreme lameness. A good cow could lose condition at an alarming rate due simply to the pain. The medieval-sounding name came from the fact that the dead tissue gave off a particularly offensive smell. The treatment we used to employ ranged from the tedious to the heroic. A cow's hind feet were never meant to be lifted up, 
and I was always grateful when it was a forefoot which was affected. With hind feet, even applying antiseptics was a chore. If that didn't work, we bandaged on pads of cotton wool impregnated with caustics like copper sulphate. A very popular treatment among the farmers was dressing the area with Stockholm tar and salt, a messy and unpleasant business with the feet whistling round the head of the operator. So I couldn't believe it when the representative told me that an injection of M and B 693 into the vein would rapidly clear up the condition. I actually laughed at the young man. I know you chaps have to make a living, but this sounds like one of your tallest stories. It works, I tell you, he said. It has been well tested, and I promise you it really does the trick. And you don't have to touch the foot at all? No, only for diagnosis. Then you can forget about it. How long does it take to have an effect? Just a few days. And I give you my word, the cow is sometimes much better within 24 hours. It sounded like a beautiful dream. OK, I said. Send some on. We'll give it a try. He made a note on his pad, then looked up. There's just one thing. This drug is very irritant. You must be sure you don't get it subcutaneous or it could cause an abscess. As he walked out of the door, I wondered if this really meant the end of one of our most disagreeable tasks. I had already had occasion to be thankful for the beneficent M&B tablets. They had wrought some minor miracles in our practice. But I found it hard to believe that an intravenous injection could cure a necrotic condition of the foot. When the stuff arrived, I had the same trouble convincing the farmers. What are you doing injecting the neck? You should be putting it into bloody foot. Or, is that all you're going to do? Aren't you going to give me somewhere to put on foot? These were typical remarks, and my answers were halting, because I had the same reservations as the stock owners. But, oh, how magically everybody's attitude changed, because it was just as the young man said. Very often, within a single day, the beast was walking sound. The swelling had gone down. The pain had vanished. It was like witchcraft. It was a giant step forward, and I was at the height of my euphoria when I saw Robert Maxwell's cow. The reddened, swollen foot. The agonised hopping. The stinking discharge. It was all there. The fact is that it was so bad that I was delighted, because I had found that the worst cases, with the acute lameness and the interdigital tissues pouting from toe and heel, were the ones which recovered quickest. "'We'll have some work on with this un,' the farmer grunted. He was in his late forties, a dynamic little man and one of the bright farmers of the district. He was always to the fore in farmers' discussion groups, always eager to learn and teach. Not a bit of it, Mr. Maxwell, I said airily. There's a new injection for this now. No foot dressing. That's gone for good. Well, that would be a blessing anyway. It's savage amusement hanging on to cow's feet. He bent over the leg and looked down. Where exactly do you inject this new stuff, then? In the neck. In the neck? I grinned. I never seem to get tired of the reaction. That's right, into the jugular vein. Well, the summit new every day now. Robert Maxwell shrugged and smiled, but he accepted it. The intelligent farmers like him were the ones who didn't argue. It was always the thick heads who knew everything. Just hold the nose, I said. That's right. Pull the head a little way round. Fine. I raised the juggler with my finger and it stood out like a hose pipe as I slipped the needle into it. The M&B solution ran into the bloodstream in about two minutes and I pulled the needle out. Well... That's it, I said, with a trace of smugness. Nothing else? Not a thing. Forget about it. The cow will be sound in a few days. Well, I don't know. Robert Maxwell looked at me with a half smile. You young fellas keep surprising me. I've been in farming all my life, but you do things I've never dreamt of. I saw him at a farmer's meeting about a week later. How's that cow? I asked. Just like you said. Sound as a bell of brass. That stuff shifts foul all right. There's no doubt about it. It's like magic. I was just expanding when his expression changed. But there's a heck of a swelling on her neck. You mean where I injected her? Yes. My happy feeling evaporated. I didn't like the sound of that. My first thought was that I must have got some of the solution under the skin but I seem to remember the blood still gushing from the needle when I pulled it out. That's funny, I said. I can't see any reason for that. 
Robert Maxwell shook his head. I can't either. I did that cow over with fly spray right after you left. Could some of that have gotten your needle wound? No, surely not. I've never heard of such a thing. I'd better have a look at her tomorrow. I made it one of my first calls next morning. The farmer had not been exaggerating. There was a marked swelling on the neck, but it was not confined to the injection site. It ran right along the course of the jugular. The vein itself had a solid, corded feel, and there was edema around the swollen area. She's got phlebitis, I said. The vein has somehow got infected through my injection. How would that happen? I don't know. I'm pretty sure none of the solution escaped, and my needle was clean. Was clean. Was clean. The farmer peered closely at the cow's neck. It's not like an abscess, is it? No, I replied, there's no abscess. And what's that long, hard lump going up to the jaw? That's a thrombus. A what? A thrombus. A big clot in the vein. I wasn't enjoying this little pathological lecture, considering that I had been responsible for the whole thing myself. Robert Maxwell gave me a searching look. Well, what's going to happen? What do we do? Usually, collateral circulation develops within a few weeks. That is, other veins take over the job. And in the meantime, I'll put her on to a course of mixed sulfanamide powders. Ah, well, she doesn't seem bothered, the farmer said. That was one gleam of light. The cow had been looking round at us contentedly as we spoke, and now I saw her pulling a little hay from her rack. No, no, she doesn't look concerned at all. I'm sorry this has happened, but it should just be a question of time before she's right. He scratched the root of the animal's tail for a moment. Would bathing with hot water do any good? I shook my head vigorously. Please don't touch that place at all. It would be dangerous if that clock broke down. I left the powders and drove away, but I had that nasty feeling I always have when I know I have boobed. I gripped the wheel and swore under my breath. What had I done wrong? The sterilised, disposable needles and syringes which we take for granted now were unknown then. But Siegfried and I always boiled our hypodermics and carried them in cases where they were always immersed in surgical spirit. We could hardly do more. Had the farmer's fly spray done something? It's hard to believe. In any case, I comforted myself with the thought that the cow didn't look ill. These cases recovered in time. But the unpalatable fact remained. That animal had had a simple case of fowl. Until James Herriot, MRCBS, took a hand, and now she had jugular phlebitis. Helen had just put my breakfast in front of me on the following morning when the phone rang. It was Robert Maxwell. That cow's dead, he said. I stared stupidly at the wall in front of me for several seconds before I could speak. Dead? Aye, found her laid in her stall this morning. Just as though she'd dropped down. Mr Maxwell, I, uh... I had to clear my throat more than once. <clears throat> I'm, uh, terribly sorry. I never expected this. What's happened, then? The farmer's voice was strangely matter-of-fact. There's only one explanation, I said. Embolism. What's that? It's when a piece of the clot breaks off and gets into the circulation. When an embolus reaches the heart, it usually means death. I see. That would do it, then. I swallowed. Let me say again, Mr Maxwell, I am very sorry. Ah, well. There was a pause. These things happen in farming. I just thought I'd let you know. Good morning. I felt sick as I put the phone down, and the feeling persisted as I sat at the breakfast table, staring at my plate. Aren't you going to eat, Jim? Helen asked. I looked down sadly at the nice slice of home-fed ham. Sorry, Helen, it's no good. I can't tackle it. Oh, come on! My wife smiled and pushed the plate nearer to me. I know you worry about your work, but I've never known it put you off your food. I shrugged miserably. But this is different. I've never killed a cow before. Of course, I didn't know for sure. I never will know. But the thing stayed with me for a long time. I am a great believer in Napoleon's dictum. Throw off your worries when you throw off your clothes. And I had never known the meaning of insomnia. But for many nights, turgid jugular veins and floating emboli 
brought me gasping to wakefulness. As time passed, I continued to wonder at the farmer's attitude on the phone. Most people would have been furious at a disaster like this, and it would have been natural enough if Robert Maxwell had blasted me at great length. But he hadn't been rude, hadn't even tried to blame me. Of course, there was always the possibility that he might be going to sue me. He was a nice man, but after all, he had suffered a financial loss, and it would not take a legal genius to make out a good case that I was the villain. But the solicitor's letter never arrived. In fact, I did not hear a word from the farmer for nearly a month. And since I had been a regular visitor on his place, I concluded that he had changed his veterinary surgeon. Well, I had lost the practice a good client, and that was not a pleasant thought either. Then, one afternoon, the phone rang, and it was Robert Maxwell again, speaking in the same quiet voice. I want you to come and look at one of me cows, Mr. Harriet. There's something amiss with her. A wave of relief went through me. Not a mention of the other thing, just a call for assistance, as if nothing had happened. There were a lot of charitable farmers in the Dales, and this man was one of them. I just hoped I could make it up to him in some way. What I wanted was a case which I could cure quickly, and if possible, in a spectacular manner. I had a lot of ground to make up on this farm. Robert Maxwell received me with his usual quiet courtesy. That was a good rain last night, Mr. Harriet. The grass was getting ripe parched. It was as though my last unhappy visit had never happened. The cow was a big Frisian, and when I saw her my hopes of a cheap triumph vanished in an instant. She was standing arch-backed and gaunt, staring at the wall in front of her. One thing I hate to see is a cow staring at the wall. As we approached, she showed no interest, and I made a spot diagnosis. This was traumatic reticulitis. She had swallowed a wire. I would have to operate on her, and after my last experience in this bar, the idea did not appeal. Yet, when I began to examine her, I realised that things were not adding up. The rumen was working well, seething and bubbling under my stethoscope, and when I pinched her withers, she did not grunt, just swivelled an anxiety-written eye in my direction before turning her attention to the wall again. She's a bit thin, I said. Ah, she is. Robert Maxwell dug his hands into his pockets and surveyed the animal gloomily. And I don't know why. She's had no but the best of stuff to eat, but she's lost condition fast over the last few days. Pulse, respiration and temperature was normal. This was a funny one. Funny one. Funny one. At first I thought she had colic, the farmer said. She kept trying to kick at her belly. Kicking at her belly? Something was stirring at the back of my mind. Yes. That was often a symptom of nephritis, and as if to clinch my decision, the animal cocked her tail and sent a jet of bloody urine into the channel. I looked at the pool behind her. There were flecks of pus among the blood, and though I knew her trouble now, it did not make me happy. I turned to the farmer. It's her kidneys, Mr. Maxwell. Her kidneys? What's the matter with them? Well, they're inflamed. They've become infected in some way. It's called pyelonephritis. Probably the bladder is affected too. The farmer blew out his cheeks. Is it serious? How I wish I could give him, of all people, a light answer, but there was no doubt that this was a highly fatal condition. I had a feeling of doom. I'm afraid so, I replied. It is very serious. I had a feeling there was something far wrong. Can you do out for her? Yes, I said. I would like to try her with some mixed sulfonamides. He glanced at me quickly. That was what I had used for the phobitis. It really is the best thing, I went on hurriedly. Cows like this used to be hopeless to treat, but since the sulphur drugs came on the scene, we do have a chance. He gave me one of his long, calm looks. All right, then. We'd better get started. I'll keep an eye on her, I said as I handed over the powders. And I did keep an eye on her. I was in the Maxwell Byer every day. I desperately wanted that cow to live. But after four days, there was no improvement. In fact, she was slowly sinking. I was steeped in gloom as I stood by the farmer's side and looked at the animal's jutting ribs and pelvic bones. She was thinner than ever, and still she passed that blood-stained urine. I could not bear the thought that another tragedy was going to follow so soon after the first one, 
but the certainty was growing in my mind that death was imminent. The sulfanamides are keeping her alive, I said, but we need something stronger. Is there anything stronger? Yes. Penicillin. Penicillin. The marvellous new drug. The first of the antibiotics. But as yet, the veterinary profession had no injectable form. All we had were the tiny tubes, each containing 300 milligrams in an oily base for the treatment of mastitis. The nozzle of the tube was inserted in the teat canal and the contents squeezed up in the udder. It was a magical improvement on any previous mastitis treatment, but at that stage of my career I had never injected an antibiotic into an animal hypodermically. I am not usually inventive, but I had a sudden idea. I went out to my car, found a box of twelve mastitis tubes and tried the nozzle in the base of a record hypodermic needle. It fitted perfectly. I am no scientific theorist, so I didn't know whether I was doing the right thing or not, but I plunged the needle into the cow's rump and squeezed tube after tube into the depths of the muscle until the box was empty. Would the penicillin be absorbed in that form? I didn't know, but there was comfort in the knowledge that at least it was in there. It was a spark of hope. I kept this up for three days, and on the third day I knew I was doing some good. Look, I said to Robert Maxwell, her back isn't arched now. She seems to have relaxed. The farmer nodded. You're right. She isn't as tucked up as she was. The sight of the cow standing there peacefully looking around her and occasionally pulling a mouthful of hay from her rack was like a blast of trumpets to me. The pain in the kidneys was plainly subsiding, and the farmer had said that the urine was not as dark as it was. I seemed to go mad after that. With a scent of victory in my nostrils, I pumped my little tubes into the animal day after day. I didn't know the correct dose for a bovine. Nobody did at that time. So I just whacked them in willy-nilly, sometimes more, sometimes less, and all the time the improvement continued steadily. There came the happy day when I was quite certain that the battle was won. As I worked on the cows, she straddled her legs and sent out a cascade of crystal-clear urine. I stepped back, and, as if for the first time, I contemplated the change in my patient. The gaunt frame of that first day was padded with flesh, and the cow's coat shone with the gloss of health. She had returned to normal just as quickly as she had fallen away. It was remarkable. I threw down the empty box. "'Well, Mr. Maxwell, I think we can say she's about right.' I'll give her another treatment tomorrow, and that will be the end. You're coming back tomorrow, then? Yes, for the last time. The farmer's face grew grave, and he stepped closer to me. All right, then. I have a complaint to make about you. Oh, God. At last he was going to tackle me about that phlebitis. And what a terrible moment to pick, just when I was flushed with success. Human nature could be very strange, and if he had decided to give me hell after all this time, there was nothing I could do about it. I would just have to take it. Oh, yes, I replied shakily, and what is that? He leant forward and tapped my chest with his forefinger. His face was transfigured, heavy with menace. Do you think I've got nothing better to do than sweep up after you every day? Sweep up? What? I stared at him stupidly. He waved an arm over the buyer floor. Just look at all this dang mess. I've got to clear it away. I looked down at the scattering of empty penicillin tubes, the paper pamphlets which always went with them, and the discarded box. Totally unheeding, I'd hurled them far and wide as I worked. Gosh, I'm sorry, I muttered. I didn't realise I was interrupted by a great burst of laughter from the farmer. Nay, hey, I'm just having you on, lad. Of course you didn't realise. You were hour busy curing me good cow. He thumped me on the shoulder and I knew it was his way of saying thanks. That was my first experience of injecting an antibiotic. And even though the method was bizarre, I learned something from it. But I learned more on that farm about the way to live than I did about veterinary science. Over the following thirty years I knew him, the farmer never alluded to that disaster which he could so easily have laid at my door. During that period there were occasions when I suffered misfortunes due to the shortcomings of others, 
when I found people at fault and at my mercy if I wished to make trouble for them. At these times I had a standard of conduct to follow. I tried to behave like Robert Maxwell. Chapter 11 You know, Jim, said Tristan, pulling thoughtfully at his woodbine, I often wonder if there is any other household where the mark of a lady's favour is expressed in goat shit. In quiet moments I often thought about the old bachelor days in Skeldale House, and it was at one of those times that I recalled Tristan's observation. I could remember looking up at him from the daybook in surprise. Well, isn't that funny? I've just been thinking the same thing. It certainly is rather an odd business. We had just come through from the dining room, and my memory of the breakfast table was very clear. Mrs. Hall always placed our letters next to our plates, and there, at Siegfried's place, dominating the scene like an emblem of triumph, stood the tin of goat droppings from Miss Grantley. We all knew what it was, despite its wrapping of brown paper, because Miss Grantley always used the same container, an empty cocoa tin about six inches high. Either she collected them from friends, or she was very fond of cocoa. One indisputable thing was that she was very fond of goats. In fact, they seemed almost to rule her existence, which was strange because the care of goats was an unlikely hobby for a blonde beauty who could have stepped effortlessly into the film world. Another odd thing about Miss Grantley was that she had never married. Each time I had seen her at her house, I had marvelled that anybody like her was able to keep the men away. She would be about thirty, with a nicely rounded figure and elegant legs, and sometimes when I looked at the fine contours of her face, I wondered whether that rather firm jaw might have frightened prospective suitors. But no, she was cheerful and charming. I decided that she just didn't want to get married. She had a lovely home and obviously plenty of money. She appeared to be perfectly happy. There was no doubt at all that the goat droppings were a mark of favour. Miss Grantley took her stock-keeping very seriously and insisted on regular laboratory examination of faeces samples for internal parasites or any other abnormality which might be found. These samples were always addressed personally to Mr. Siegfried Farnan, and I had attached no importance to this until one morning, a few days after I had pleased her immensely by removing an embedded piece of chaff from one of her Billy's eyes, the familiar tin appeared by my breakfast plate, and I read, James Herriot, Esquire. MRCVS on the label. That was when I realised it was an accolade, a gesture of approval. In ancient days, the feudal knights would carry a glove at their saddle-bow, or a scarf on their lance-point as a symbol of their lady's esteem, but with Miss Grantley, it was goat droppings. On the occasion when I got mine, Siegfried's face showed the slightest flicker of surprise, and I suppose I might have shown a trace of smugness, but he needn't have worried. Within a week or two, the tin reappeared at his end of the table. And after all, it was the natural thing, because if sheer male attractiveness entered into this situation, there was no doubt that Siegfried was out in front by a street. Tristan pursued the local girls enthusiastically and with considerable success. I had no reason to complain about my share of female company, but Siegfried was in a different class. He seemed to drive women mad. He didn't have to chase them. They chased him. I hadn't known him long before I realised that the tales I had heard about the irresistible appeal of tall, lean-faced men were true. And when you added his natural charm and commanding personality, it was inevitable that the goat droppings would land regularly by his plate. In fact, that is how it was for a long time, even though Tristan and I paid almost as many visits to Miss Grantley's goats as Siegfried. As I said, she seemed to be quite rich because she called us out to the slightest ailment and was as good a client as some of our big farmers. However, when I heard her voice on the telephone one morning, I knew that this time it wasn't for something trivial. She sounded agitated. Mr. Elliot, Tina has caught her shoulder on a nail and torn herself rather badly. I do hope you can come out immediately. Yes, as it happens, I can. There is nothing urgent at the moment. I'll leave right away. A mild glow of satisfaction rippled through me. This would be just another stitching job, and I liked stitching. It was easy, and always impressed the client. I would be on happier ground there than when Miss Grantley was quizzing me about goat diseases. They had taught me practically nothing about goats at college, 
and though I had tried to catch up by snatches of reading here and there, I realised uncomfortably that I was no expert. I was leaving the room when Tristan levered himself slowly from the depths of the armchair where he spent a lot of his time. Since breakfast I had been aware of his presence only by the rustle of the Daily Mirror under a cloud of woodbine smoke. He yawned and stretched. Miss Grantley, eh? I think I'll come with you. Just feel like a ride out. I smiled. OK, come on then. He was always good company. Miss Grantley met us in a tight-fitting pale blue boiler suit of some silky material which did nothing to diminish her attractions. Oh, thank you so much for coming, she said. Please follow me. Following her was rewarding. In fact, on entering the goat house, Tristan failed to see the step and fell onto his knees. Miss Grantley glanced at him briefly before hurrying to a pen at the far end. There she is, she said and put a hand over her eyes. I can't bear to look. Tina was a fine white seinen, but her beauty was ravaged by a huge laceration, which had pulled the skin down from her shoulder in a long V, exposing the naked smoothness of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles. The bony spine of the scapula gleamed white through the blood. It was a mess, but I had to stop myself rubbing my hands. It was all superficial, and I could put it right, and look very good in the process. Already I could see myself inserting the last stitch and pointing to the now almost invisible wound. There now, that looks a lot better, doesn't it? Miss Grantley would be in raptures. Yes. Yes, I murmured in my most professional manner as I probed the damaged area. It's nasty. It's really nasty. Miss Grantley clasped her hands together. But do you think you can save her? Oh, yes. I nodded weightily. It will be a big stitching job and take rather a long time, but I feel sure she will pull through. Oh, thank heaven! She gave a long sigh of relief. I'll fetch some hot water. Soon I was ready for action. My needles, cotton wool, scissors, suture materials and forceps laid out on a clean towel. Tristan holding Tina's head, Miss Grantley hovering anxiously, ready to help. I cleaned the whole area thoroughly, sprinkled dusting powder with a liberal hand, and began to stitch. Miss Grantley was soon in action, passing me the scissors to clip each suture. It was a nice, smooth start, but it was a very large wound, and this was going to take some time. I searched my mind for light conversation. Tristan chipped in, apparently thinking the same thing. Wonderful animal, the goat, he said lightly. Oh, yes. Miss Grantley looked across at him with a bright smile. I do agree. When you think about it, they are probably the earliest of the domestic animals, he went on. It always thrills me to realise that there is ample evidence of domestication of goats in prehistoric times. There are cave paintings of goats, and later ancient books from all over the world mention their existence. They have been part of the world of man since recorded time. It is a fascinating thought. From my squatting position, I looked up at him in surprise. In my relationship with Tristan, I had discovered several things which fascinated him, but goats were not among them. And another thing, he went on, they have such a marvellous metabolism. They will consume food which other animals won't look at, and they will produce abundant milk from that food. Yes, indeed, breathed Miss Grantley. Tristan laughed. They're such characters, too. Tough and hardy under all climatic conditions, absolutely fearless, and ready to tackle any other animal, no matter how large. And, of course, it is a known fact that they can eat with impunity many poisonous plants which would kill most creatures in a very short time. Oh, they are amazing. Miss Grantley gazed at my friend and passed the scissors to me without turning her head. I felt I ought to make some contribution. Goats certainly are extremely... I began. But really, you know... Tristan was in full flow again. I think that the thing which appeals to me most about them is their affectionate nature. They are friendly and sociable, and I feel that that is why people become so deeply attached to them. 
Miss Grantley nodded gravely. How true! How true! My colleague stretched out a hand and fingered the hay in the animal's rack. I see you feed them properly. There's all sorts of rough stuff in here, thistles and bits of shrubs and coarse plants. Obviously you know that goats prefer such things to grass. No wonder your animals are so healthy. Oh, thank you, she blushed faintly. Of course, I give them concentrates too. Whole grain, I hope? Oh, yes, always. Good. Good. Keeps up the pH of the rumen. You know you can get hypertrophy of the ruminal walls and inhibition of cellulose digesting bacteria with low pH. Well, no. I didn't really understand it in those terms. She was staring at him as if he were a prophet. Ah, no matter, said Tristan airily. You are doing all the right things, and that is the important point. Can I have the scissors, please? I grunted. I was beginning to feel cramped in my bent-over position, and also a little piqued at the growing impression that Miss Grantley had forgotten all about me. But I stitched on doggedly, one half of my mind watching thankfully as the skin gradually covered the denuded area, the other listening in amazement as Tristan pontificated on the construction of goat houses, their dimensions, ventilation and relative humidity. A long time later, Miss Grantley hardly noticed as I inserted the last suture and straightened up wearily. Well, now, that looks better, doesn't it, I said. But there wasn't the expected impact because Tristan and my client were deeply involved in a discussion of the relative merits of the different breeds of goats. Are you really in favour of the Toggenberg and the Anglo-Nubian, she asked. Oh, yes. Tristan inclined his head judicially. Excellent animals, both of them. Miss Grantley suddenly became aware that I had finished. Oh, thank you so much, she said absently. You've taken such pains, I am most grateful. Now you must both come in for a cup of coffee. As we balanced our cups on our knees in the elegant sitting room, Tristan carried on unabated. He dealt in depth with reproductive problems, obstetrics and the feeding of weaned kids, and he was well into a little treatise on anaesthesia for dehorning when Miss Grantley turned towards me. She was clearly still under his spell, but no doubt felt that it would be only polite to bring me into the conversation. Mr. Harriet, one thing worries me. I share a pasture with the farmer next door, and very often my goats are grazing with his ewes and lambs. Now, I have heard that his sheep are troubled with coccidiosis. Is there any chance that my goats could contract it from them? I took a long pull at my coffee cup to give myself time to think. Well, um, I would say my friend broke in again effortlessly. Most unlikely. It seems that most types of coccidiosis are specific to their individual hosts. I don't think you need worry on that account. Thank you. Miss Grantley addressed me again as though deciding to give me a last chance. And how about worms, Mr. Harriet? Can my goats become infected with worms from the sheep? Ah, now, let's see. My cup rattled in the saucer, and I could feel a slight perspiration breaking out on my brow. The thing is, quite so, murmured Tristan, gliding once more to my aid. As Mr. Harriet was about to say, helminthiasis is a different proposition. There is a very real danger of infection, since the common nematodes are the same in both species. You must always worm regularly. And if I can give you a brief programme... I sank deeper in my chair and let him get on with it. Only half-hearing erudite remarks about the latest anthelmintics and their actions on trichostrongyles, homunculus and ostatasia. It came to an end at last and we went out to the car. I'll come back in ten days to remove the stitches, I said, as Miss Grantley showed us off the premises. It struck me that it was just about the only sensible thing I'd said. I drove a few hundred yards along the road, then I stopped the car. Since when have you been a goat lover? I demanded bitterly. And where the hell did you get all that high-powered stuff you were preaching back there? Tristan giggled, then threw back his head and laughed immoderately. Sorry, Jim, he said when he recovered. I have exams coming up in a few weeks, as you know, and I heard that one of the examiners is really goat-orientated. Last night, I boned up on every bit of goat literature I could find. Uncanny how I had the opportunity to trot it all out so soon after. Ah, well, that made sense. Tristan had the kind of brain which absorbed information like a sponge. 
I could believe that he would have to read those chapters only once and they would be his for good. In my student days, I often had to go over a thing about six times before it sank in. I see, I said. You better let me see those things you read last night. I didn't realise I was so ignorant. There was an interesting little sequel about a week later. Siegfried and I were going into breakfast when my partner stopped in mid-stride and stared at the table. The familiar brown-wrapped cocoa tin was there, but it was at his brother's place. Slowly he walked over and examined the label. I had a look too, and there was no mistake. It read, Mr. Tristan Farnan. Siegfried said nothing, but sat down at the head of the table. Very soon the young man himself joined us, examined the tin with interest, and started on his meal. Not a word was spoken, and the three of us sat in silence. But over everything the undeniable fact hung heavy in the room. Tristan, for the moment at least, was top man. Chapter 12 October the 31st, 1961 Getting into bed last night wasn't easy. With every passing minute the ship's movements became more violent and I fell down several times while undressing. Once in the bunk I was thrown from side to side, not in the gentle roll of the other nights but with an unpleasant jarring bump. I turned onto my stomach, braced arms and legs against the wood and after about half an hour I managed to fall asleep. Around 2 a.m. I was jerked from a troubled slumber into a world gone mad. I was being tossed around like a rubber ball. The wind howled, driving rain spattered against the cabin window, and a frightful din rose from all over the ship. The banging and clattering was deafening. I could hear the pans in the galley flying around against the walls. A loose iron door clanged repeatedly on its hinges, and from everywhere came a medley of undefined rattles and groans. I switched on the light and looked out on a scene of chaos. My money, keys, pipe and tobacco were rolling about on the floor. The desk drawers were shooting out to their full extent, then slamming back again. The chair and my suitcase were sliding from one side to another. Reeling about in the pandemonium, falling down repeatedly, I did my best to clear up the mess, then got back into bed. But I couldn't stand the thumping of the drawers against the chair. So I got out again jammed the chair against the drawers and my suitcase between chair and bunk and clambered wearily up again. But though this cured most of the local noise, the uproar outside was unabated and I got very little sleep after that. At dawn, a cheerless sight greeted me as I looked out of my window. All around was an empty waste of grey water tossed up into mighty green and white-topped waves which broke up into clouds of spray as the wind caught them. It gave me an uncomfortable thrill to see our little ship climb up one monstrous wave after another and then drop into a series of deep, watery valleys beyond. The Baltic was really playing up. My first thought was for the sheep, but I heard the knock on my door and the familiar voice of the mess boy. Breakfast, Mr. Harriet. I hurried to the mess room. I would have a quick bite and then collect round. The captain was seated alone at the table when I entered. "'Good morning, Mr. Harriet,' he said, "'and gave me a long, appraising stare which I couldn't quite understand. "'I sat down and waited. "'I was impatient to get down to the hold, "'and I wished the breakfast would arrive. "'On top of that, I was distinctly peckish, "'and I picked around busily at the smoked ham, herrings and salt beef. "'The captain watched me with narrowed eyes all the time. "'After a few minutes, the mess boy appeared. "'His face was as green as grass,' and he averted his eyes from the piled plateful of sausages, scrambled eggs and fried potatoes. I grabbed a piece of rye bread and fell upon the savoury mound without delay. I was hacking at a sausage when the captain spoke again. Are you feeling all right, Mr. Harriet? I looked up in surprise and replied with my mouth full. Mm, yes, fine, thanks. A bit tired, maybe. I didn't get much sleep last night. But you are hungry, yes? I am, yes. I certainly am. All that bouncing around seems to have stimulated my appetite. This is most unusual, the captain said in his precise way. We have just come through a Force 9 gale, and I was sure you would be seasick this morning. You are a very good sailor. I laughed. Well, thank you. I don't suppose there's anything very clever about that. I'm just made that way. Motion of any kind has never troubled me. Yes. Yes. The captain nodded gravely. 
Still, it is remarkable. Didn't you notice Peter's face? Peter? Yes, the mess boy. All mess boys are called Peter, by the way, no matter what their real name is. He is feeling very ill. In fact, he is always ill in bad weather. Oh, poor lad. It was pretty rough last night, wasn't it? Yes, Mr. Herriot. And I might say that we were sailing with the wind behind us. If we have to come back in weather like that, with the wind against us, then heaven help us. It will be much worse. Really? I didn't know that. I... Round's face, poking round the door, cut me off in mid-sentence. Daughter, come quick! The sheeps! The sheeps are bad! I bolted the last of the sausage and followed him to the hold as quickly as the heaving of the ship would allow me. Look, Doctor! The big Dane pointed excitedly at one of the Romney Marsh rams. The sheep was standing with some difficulty, legs straddled wide. It was panting violently. Its mouth gaped, and a bubbling saliva poured from its lips. The normally docile eyes were wide and charged with terror as the animal fought for breath. All the euphoria I had felt since boarding the Eris Clausen evaporated as I rushed feverishly around the pens. A lot of the other sheep were behaving in exactly the same way, and I realised with a sense of shock that I wasn't on a pleasure cruise after all. I suppressed a rising panic as I examined the animals. They all looked as though they were going to die, and I had a strong conviction that those unknown Russians waiting at the other end were not going to be amused when the expert veterinary attendant presented them with a heap of carcasses. A fine start it would be to my first venture at sea. But as I went round the pens again, I began to calm down. None of the sheep looked happy, but it was only the biggest which were affected in this way. All the rams, and one or two of the larger ewes, about a dozen in all. So, though it might be a tragedy, it wasn't going to be a total disaster. With round hanging on to the necks, I took the temperatures. They were all around 107 degrees Fahrenheit. I leant back against the wooden rail and tried to rationalise my thoughts. This was stress. A classical example. It must be. And up in my case, I had a few bottles of the new wonder drug, cortisone, and one of its indications was just this. I was up to my cabin and down again quicker than I thought was possible, and in the pockets of my working coat the precious bottles bumped against each other. The brand name was Predsalan. It was one of the first of the steroid products, and, though I had used it for arthritic and inflammatory conditions, I had never tried it in a case like this. It wasn't only the ship's pitching that made my hand shake and wobble as I drew the liquid into my syringe. The supply was very limited, and heaven only knew how many more sheep would go down. I rationed the injection to three cc per sheep, and as I went round the stricken animals, my spirits sank lower. Only three of them could stand. The others were slumped on their chests, necks craning forward, eyes starting from their heads, their flanks heaving uncontrollably. As I worked, round stroked the woolly heads and muttered endearments in Danish. It was the first time I had seen him look unhappy, and I knew how he felt. I hadn't been seasick, but I was sick now, with apprehension. These beautiful pedigree animals. And it was the rams, the most valuable of all, which were struck down. I could only wait now, but I was convinced that the whole business was hopeless. I realised that I couldn't bear to stand there watching them any longer, and I hurried up the iron ladders to the top deck, which was running with water and slanting at crazy angles. It was clearly no place for me, and I went up to the bridge. The captain, as always, greeted me courteously, and when I told him about the sheep, he looked thoughtful. Then he smiled. I know they are in good hands, Mr. Harriet. Do not be upset. I am sure you will cure them. I couldn't share his optimism, and in any case, I was pretty certain he was only trying to cheer me up. To take my mind off my troubles, he again showed me our position on the chart and began to talk of maritime things. We are out of the sea lanes now, he said. He waved a hand round the desolation on all sides. You see no ships now, and I think you see no ships all day. As we talked, we looked out through the glass at the bows of the ship dipping into each gulf, then climbing up the green mountain on the other side. This was the best position to appreciate the size of those mighty waves, and a part of me never stopped being surprised as our tiny vessel fought her way up again and again. The captain fell silent for a few minutes and gazed impassively at the endless stretch of sea beyond the glass. I tell you again, Mr. Harriet, we are running before the wind now. 
And if it is like this on our return journey, we are in big trouble. He turned and smiled. You see, once we are unloaded, we must come back straight away. A ship is doing no good lying in harbour. All the time I was hanging on grimly to a rail, and it fascinated me to see the mate stroll casually onto the bridge, pipe in mouth, hands in pockets, and begin to move around effortlessly. At times his body seemed to be at an angle of 45 degrees to the ground. I had noticed that all the crew were wonderfully adept at this, but for me it was frankly very dangerous to walk anywhere at all without support. After two hours I had to give in to my gnawing anxiety. It would be too soon to expect any improvement in my patients, but at least I could check to see that there were no worse. I struggled a foot at a time back to my cabin to get my gear, and on the way I passed the galley. The cell-like room was a chaos of tumbled pans and plates, and the walls were almost entirely covered with soup, which Nielsen the cook was wiping away with a cloth. When he saw me, he nodded and smiled as he worked. He didn't seem in the least put out. This was probably a common occurrence for him. Down those iron ladders again. They really were uncomfortable things when the world was whirling and wet. I rushed straight to the pen which held the first ram, and for a moment I was sure I'd gone to the wrong place because a large woolly head was regarding me placidly over the rails. A few strands of hay hung from the mouth, then the jaws began to move in a contented chew. I was standing there, bewildered, when from the deep straw in the pen the massive figure of Round rose like a golden-maned genie and began to wave his arms about. Look, Doctor, look! His boxer's face vibrated in every feature as he gestured at the ram, then at the other patients in the hold. I moved among them like a man in a dream. They were all normal. Not just improved, but right back to where they were before the trouble started, and all within two hours. Over my veterinary career, I have learned about new things in various odd places, and I learned about cortisone in the bowels of a little cattle ship on the way to Russia. And it was sweet, made sweeter by the ecstatic response of Round to the little miracle. He vaulted over the rails from pen to pen, hugging the sheep as though they were dogs and laughing non-stop. It's wonderful, Doctor. It's wonderful. So quick. They dying, now they live. So quick. How you do it? He stared at me with undisguised admiration. Just then I felt a pang of envy for Danish vets. I have had my black moments in practice, but I have also pulled off the occasional spectacular cure without seeing anything like this reaction from the Yorkshireman. But then, maybe Danish farmers didn't leap about with joy either. After all, Round was a sailor. Anyway, I was filled with the exhilaration which every veterinary surgeon knows when the curtain of despair is unexpectedly lifted. The pre-lunch beer with the captain tasted like nectar, and lunch itself in the swaying mess room was a celebration. Somehow the wonder man in the galley had conjured up a glorious vegetable soup with pieces of sausage and dumpling floating around in it. This was followed by fregadillas, which were delicious, and made, I was told, from chopped pork and veal rolled into balls, bound together with egg and highly spiced. As I wrote my journal, I was conscious that it was in danger of degenerating into a kind of cattle boat cookbook. But how Nielsen managed to produce this kind of food in a cubbyhole and in stormy weather was a constant source of wonder to me. I was finding it difficult to resist making references to his artistry. He had a habit of poking his head round the door halfway through every meal. He looked only at me, the one who recognised him as a culinary genius. And when I put my fingers to my lips and closed my eyes, his sweating face beamed with delight. He thought I was wonderful. My cabin was almost opposite the galley, and between meals he experimented on me constantly with his own special tidbits. I admit I was a willing subject. The bad weather continued throughout the day, and, as the captain had prophesied, we did not see another ship at any time. I kept a close eye on the sheep, and a few more showed the beginnings of the stress symptoms, but I was on them immediately with my pretzelan, and crushed the trouble before it became alarming. That night, the ritual after-dinner session with the schnapps and lager was particularly pleasant. The ship's officers were such likeable men. They showed me pictures of their families and of the places they had visited, and the conversation never flagged. At the end, the captain raised a finger and looked at me smilingly. Would you like to telephone your wife? I laughed. You're joking, aren't you? 
No, no, it is quite simple. He took me up to the bridge, and within a few minutes I was talking to Helen and daughter Rosie in the darkness. With a sense of unreality, I heard their voices, giving me the news of home, of Jimmy at the university, of the latest football scores. It put the final touch on a rewarding day. I made a close inspection of the sheep before going to my cabin, because the next day we would be in Clydida, and I should have to hand them over. They looked fine. No more stress. The lame animal had recovered, as had the one with the discharging eyes. There was just that cough among the Lincolns, and it was a worry. What would those Russians make of it? I knew it was just a touch of parasitic bronchitis, that it was getting better all the time, and that it would soon be gone completely. But would I be able to explain that to the Russian vets? I should soon know. Chapter 13 the farm man moved between the cows and took hold of my patient's tail. And when I saw his hair cut, I knew immediately that Josh Anderson had been on the job again. It was a Sunday morning and everything fitted into place. I really didn't have to ask. Were you in the hare and pheasant last night? I inquired carelessly as I inserted my thermometer. He ran a hand ruefully over his head. Aye, bugger it, I was. You can see straight off, can't you? Missus has been playing hell with me ever since. I suppose Josh had had one too many, eh? Ah, he had. I should have known better picking a Saturday night. It's my own fault. Josh Anderson was one of the local barbers. He liked his job, but he also liked his beer. In fact, he was devoted to it, even to the extent of taking his scissors and clippers to the pub with him every night. For the price of a pint, he would give anybody a quick trim in the gents' lavatory. Habituates of the hare and pheasant were never surprised to find one of the customers sitting impassively on the toilet seat with Josh snip-snipping round his head. With beer at sixpence a pint, it was good value, but Josh's clients knew they were taking a chance. If the barber's intake had been moderate, they would escape relatively unscathed, because the standard of hairstyling in the Dalaby district was not very fastidious. But if he had imbibed beyond a certain point, terrible things could happen. Josh had not as yet been known to cut off anybody's ear, but if you strolled round the town on Sundays and Mondays, you were liable to come across some very strange coiffeurs. I looked again at the farm man's head. From my experience, I judged that Josh would be around the ten-pint mark when he did that one. The right sideburn had been trimmed off meticulously just below eye level, while the left was non-existent. The upper hair seemed to have been delved into at random, leaving bare patches in some parts and long dangling wisps in others. I couldn't see the back, but I had no doubt it would be interesting too. There could be a pigtail or anything lurking behind there. Yes, I decided. Definitely a ten-pinter. After twelve to fourteen pints, Josh was inclined to cast away all caution and simply run over his victim's head with the clippers, leaving a tuft in front. The classical convict's crop, which necessitated wearing a cap, pulled well down at all times for several weeks thereafter. I always played safe, and when my hair needed cutting, I went to Josh's shop where he operated in a state of strict sobriety. I was sitting there a few days later, waiting my turn, with my dog Sam under my seat, and as I watched the barber at work, the wonder of human nature seemed to glow with a particular radiance. There was a burly man in the chair, and his red face, reflected in the mirror above the enveloping white sheet, was contorted every few seconds with spasms of pain, because the simple fact was that Josh didn't cut hair, he pulled it out. He did this not only because his equipment was antiquated and needed sharpening, but because he had perfected a certain flick of the wrist with his hand clippers, which wrenched the hairs from their follicles at the end of each stroke. He had never got round to buying electric clippers, but with his distinctive technique, I doubt whether it would have made any difference. One wonder was that anybody went to Josh for a haircut because there was another barber in the town. My own opinion was that it was because everybody liked him. Sitting there in his shop, I looked at him as he worked. He was a tiny man in his fifties with a bald head which made a mockery of the rows of hair restorer on his shelves, and on his face rested the gentle smile which never seemed to leave him. That smile and the big, curiously unworldly eyes gave him an unusual attraction. 
and then there was his obvious love of his fellow men. As his client rose from the chair, patently relieved that his ordeal was over, Josh fussed around him, brushing him down, patting his back and chattering gaily. You could see that he hadn't just been cutting the man's hair. He had been enjoying a happy social occasion. Next to the big farmer, Josh looked smaller than ever, a minute husk of humanity. And I marvelled, as I had often done, at how he managed to accommodate all that beer. Of course, foreigners are often astonished at the Englishman's ability to consume vast quantities of ale. Even now, after forty years in Yorkshire, I cannot compete. Maybe it's my Glasgow upbringing, but after two or three pints, discomfort sets in. The remarkable thing is that throughout the years I can hardly recall seeing a Yorkshireman drunk. Their natural reserve relaxes and they become progressively jovial as the long cascade goes down their throats, but they seldom fall about or do anything silly. Josh, for instance. He would swallow around eight pints every night of the week except Saturday when he stepped up his intake to between ten and fourteen, yet he never looked much different. His professional skill suffered, but that was all. He was turning to me now... Well, Mr. Harriet, it's good to see you again. He warmed me with his smile, and those wide eyes with their almost mystic depths caressed me as he ushered me to the chair. Are you very well? I'm fine, thank you, Mr. Anderson, I replied. And how are you? Nicely, sir. Nicely. He began to tuck the sheet under my chin, then laughed delightedly as my little beagle trotted in under the folds. Hello, Sam. You're there as usual, I see. He bent and stroked the sleek ears. By God, Mr. Eric, he's a faithful friend. Never lets you out of his sight if he can help it. That's right, I said. And I don't like to go anywhere without him. I screwed round in my chair. By the way, didn't I see you with a dog the other day? Josh paused, scissors in hand. You didn't know? A little bitch. A stray. Got it from the cat and dog home in York. Now that our kids have all left home, to Mrs and I fancied getting a dog and we think the world of her. I tell you, she's a grandin. What breed is she? He, <laughs> now you're asking. Not but a mongrel, I reckon. I can't see any pedigree about her, but money wouldn't buy her. I was about to agree with him when he held up a hand. Hang on a minute. I'll bring her down. He lived above the shop and his feet clumped on the stairs as he returned with a little bitch in his arms. They are mysterious. What do you think of that? He stood her on the floor for my inspection. I looked at the little animal. She was a light grey in colour with very long crinkled hair. In fact, at a quick glance, she looked like a miniature Wensleydale sheep. Definitely a hound of baffling lineage, but the panting mouth and swishing tail bore witness to her good nature. I like her, I said. I think you've picked a winner there. That's what we think. He stooped and fondled his new pet, and I noticed that he kept picking up the long hairs and rubbing them gently between finger and thumb again. It looked a little odd. Then it occurred to me that was what he was used to doing with his human customers. We've called her Venus, he said. Venus? Aye, because she's so beautiful. His tone was very serious. Oh, yes, I said. I see. He washed his hands, took up his scissors again, and grasped a few strands of my hair. Again I saw that he went through the same procedure of rubbing the hairs between his fingers before cutting them. I couldn't understand why he did this, but my mind was too preoccupied to give the matter much thought. I was stealing myself. Still, it wasn't too bad with the scissors, just an uncomfortable tug as the blunt edges came together. It was when he reached for the clippers that I gripped the arms of the chair as though I were at the dentist. It was all right as long as he was running the thing up the back of my neck. It was that jerk at the end, plucking the last tuft from its roots, which set my face grimacing at me in the mirror. Once or twice, an involuntary, Oh! or Ah! escaped me, but Josh gave no sign of having heard. I remember that for years I sat in that shop listening to the half-stifled cries of pain from the customers, but at no time had the barber shown any reaction. The thing was that although he was the least arrogant or conceited of men, he did consider himself a gifted hairdresser. Even now, as he gave me a final combing, I could see the pride shining from his face. Head on one side, he patted my hair repeatedly, circling the chair and viewing me from all angles, making a finicky snip here and there before holding up the hand mirror for my inspection. All right, Mr. Harriet, he inquired. 
with the quiet satisfaction which comes from a job well done. Lovely, Mr. Anderson, just fine. Relief added warmth to my voice. He bowed slightly, well pleased. Aye, you know, it's easy enough to cut hair off. The secret is knowing what to leave on. I'd heard him say it a hundred times before, but I laughed dutifully as he whisked his brush over the back of my coat. My hair used to grow pretty fast in those days, but I didn't have time to pay another visit to the barber before he arrived on my front doorstep. I was having tea at the time, and I trotted to the door in answer to the insistent ringing of the bell. He was carrying Venus in his arms, but she was a vastly different creature from the placid little animal I'd seen in his shop. She was bubbling saliva from her mouth, retching and pawing frantically at her face. Josh looked distraught. She's choking, Mr. Elliot. Look at her. She'll die if you don't do something quick. Wait a minute, Mr. Anderson. Tell me what's happened. Has she swallowed something? Aye. She's had a chicken bone. A chicken bone? Don't you know you should never give a dog chicken bones? Aye, I know, I know. Everybody knows that. But we'd had a bird for our dinner and she pinched the frame out of the dustbin a little beggy. She'd had a good crunch at it before I spotted her and now she's going to choke. He glared at me, lips quivering. He was on the verge of tears. Now just calm down, I said. I don't think Venus is choking. By the way she's pawing, I should say there's something stuck in her mouth. I grabbed the little animal's jaws with finger and thumb and forced them apart. And I saw, with a surge of relief, the sight familiar to all vets, a long spicule of bone jammed tightly between the back molars and forming a bar across the roof of the mouth. As I say, it is a common occurrence in practice, and a happy one, because it's harmless and easily relieved by a flick of the forceps. Recovery is instantaneous, skill minimal, and the kudos most warming. I loved it. I put my hand on the barber's shoulder. You can stop worrying, Mr. Anderson, it's just a bone stuck in her teeth. Come through to the consulting room and I'll have it out in a jiffy. I could see the man relaxing as we walked along the passage to the back of the house. Oh, thank God for that, Mr. Harriet. I thought you'd done it, honest I did. And we've grown right fond of the little thing. I couldn't bear to lose her. I gave a light laugh, put the dog on the table and reached for a strong pair of forceps. No question of that, I assure you. This won't take a minute. Jimmy, aged five, had left his tea and trailed after us. He watched with mild interest as I poised the instrument. Even at his age, he had seen this sort of thing many a time, and it wasn't very exciting. But you never knew in veterinary practice. It was worth hanging around because funny things could happen. He put his hands in his pockets and rocked back and forth on his heels, whistling softly as he watched me. Usually it is a simple matter of opening the mouth, clamping the forceps on the bone and removing it. But Venus recoiled from the gleaming metal, and so did the barber. The terror in the dog's eyes was reproduced fourfold in those of its owner. I tried to be soothing. This is nothing, Mr. Anderson. I'm not going to hurt her in the least, but you'll just have to hold her head firmly for a moment. The little man took a deep breath, grasped the dog's neck, screwed his eyes tight shut, and turned his head as far away as he could. Now, little Venus, I cooed, I'm going to make you better. Venus clearly didn't believe me. She struggled violently, pawing at my hand to the accompaniment of strange moaning sounds from her owner. When I did get the forceps into her mouth, she locked her front teeth on the instrument and hung on fiercely. And as I began to grapple with her, Mr. Anderson could stand it no longer and let go. The little dog leapt to the floor and resumed her inner battle there, while Jimmy watched appreciatively. I looked at the barber more in sorrow than in anger. This was just not his thing. He was manually ham-fisted, as his hairdressing proved, and he seemed quite incapable of holding a wriggling dog. Let's have another go, I said cheerfully. We'll try it on the floor this time. Maybe she's frightened of the table. It's a trifling little job, really. The little man, lips tight, eyes like slits, bent and extended trembling hands towards his dog. But each time he touched her, she slithered away from him, until with a great shuddering sigh he flopped face down on the tiles. Jimmy giggled. Things were looking up. I helped the barber to his feet. I'll tell you what, Mr. Anderson, I'll give her a short-acting anaesthetic. That will cut out all this fighting and struggling. Josh's face paled. An anaesthetic? Put her to sleep, you mean? Anxiety flickered in his eyes. Will she be all right? Of course, of course. Just leave her to me and come back for in about an hour. She'll be able to walk then. 
I began to steer him through the door into the passage. Are you sure? He glanced back pitifully at his pet. We're doing the right thing. Without a doubt. We'll only upset her if we go on this way. Very well, then. I'll go along to my brother's for an hour. Splendid. I waited till I heard the front door close behind him, then quickly made up a dose of pentothal. Dogs do not put on such a tough front when their owners are not present, and I scooped Venus easily from the floor onto the table. But her jaws were still clamped tight, and her front feet at the ready. She wasn't going to stand for any messing with her mouth. OK, old girl, have it your own way, I said. I gripped her leg above the elbow and clipped an area from the raised radial vein. In those days, Siegfried or myself were often left to anaesthetise dogs without assistance. It is wonderful what you can do when you have to. Venus didn't seem to care what I was about as long as I kept away from her face. I slid the needle into the vein, depressed the plunger, and within seconds her fighting pose relaxed. Her head dropped and her whole body sagged onto the table. I rolled her over. She was fast asleep. No trouble now, Jimmy lad, I said. I pushed the teeth apart effortlessly with finger and thumb, gripped the bone with the forceps, and lifted it from the mouth. Nothing left in there. Lovely. All done. I dropped the piece of chicken bone into the waste bin. Yes, that's how you do it, my boy. No undignified scrambling. That's the professional way. My son nodded briefly. Things had gone dull again. He had been hoping for great things when Mr. Anderson draped himself along the surgery floor, but this was tame stuff. He had stopped smiling. My own satisfied smile, too, had become a little fixed. I was watching Venus carefully, and she wasn't breathing. I tried to ignore the lurch in my stomach, because I've always been a nervous anaesthetist and not very proud of it. Even now, when I come upon one of my younger colleagues operating, I have a nasty habit of placing my hand over the patient's chest wall over the heart and standing wide-eyed and rigid for a few seconds. I know the young surgeons hate to have me spreading alarm and despondency, and one day I'm going to be told to get out in sharp terms, but I can't help it. As I watched Venus, I told myself, as always, that there was no danger. She had received the correct dose, and anyway, you often did get this period of apnea with pentothal. Everything was normal, but just the same, I wished to God she would start breathing. The heart was still going all right. I depressed the ribs a few times. Nothing. I touched the unseeing eyeball. No corneal reflex. I began to wrap my fingers on the table and stared closely at the little animal, and I could see that Jimmy was watching me just as keenly. His deep interest in veterinary practice was built upon a fascination for animals, farmers and the open air. But it was given extra colour by something else. He never knew when his father might do something funny, or something funny might happen to him. The unpredictable mishaps of the daily round were all good for a laugh, and my son, with his unerring instinct, had a feeling that something of the sort was going to happen now. His hunch was proved right when I suddenly lifted Venus from the table, shook her vainly a few times over my head, and set off at full gallop along the passage. I could hear the eager shuffle of the little slippers just behind me. I threw open the side door and shot into the back garden. I halted at the narrow part. No, there wasn't room enough there, and continued my headlong rush till I reached the big lawn. Here I dropped the little dog onto the grass and fell down on my knees by her side in an attitude of prayer. I waited and watched as my heart hammered, but those ribs were not moving and the eyes stared sightlessly ahead. Oh, this just couldn't happen. I seized Venus by a hind leg in either hand and began to whirl her round my head. Sometimes higher, sometimes lower, but attaining a remarkable speed as I put all my strength into the swing. This method of resuscitation seems to have gone out of fashion now, but it was very much in vogue then. It certainly met with the full approval of my son. He laughed so much that he fell down and sprawled on the grass. When I stopped and glared at the still immobile ribs, he cried, Again, Daddy! Again! And he didn't have to wait more than a few seconds before Daddy was in full action once more, with Venus swooping through the air like a bird on the wing. It exceeded all Jimmy's expectations. He probably had wondered about leaving his jam sandwiches to see the old man perform, but how gloriously he had been rewarded. To this day, the whole thing is so vivid. My tension and misery lest my patient should die for no reason at all, and in the background, the helpless, high-pitched laughter of my son... 
I don't know how many times I stopped, dropped the inert form on the grass, then recommenced my whirling. But at last, at one of the intervals, the chest wall gave a heave and the eyes blinked. With a gasp of relief, I collapsed face down on the cool turf and peered through the green blades as the breathing became regular and Venus began to lick her lips and look around her. I dared not get up immediately because the old brick walls of the garden were still dancing around me and I am sure I would have fallen. Jimmy was disappointed. Aren't you going to do any more, Daddy? No, son, no. I sat up and dragged Venus onto my lap. It's all over now. Well, that was funny. Why did you do it? To make the dog breathe. Do you always do that to make them breathe? No, thank heaven, not often. I got slowly to my feet and carried the little animal back to the consulting room. By the time Josh Anderson arrived, his pet was looking almost normal. She's still a little unsteady from the anaesthetic, I said, but that won't last long. Eee, isn't that grand? On that nasty bone, is it? All gone, Mr. Anderson. He shrank back as I opened the mouth. You see? I said. Not a thing. He smiled happily. Did you have any bother with her? Well, my parents brought me up to be honest rather than clever and the whole story almost bubbled out of me. But why should I worry this sensitive little man? To tell him that his dog had been almost dead for a considerable time would not cheer him, nor would it bolster his faith in me. I swallowed. Not a bit, Mr. Anderson. A quite uneventful operation. The whitest of lies, but it nearly choked me, and the aftertaste of guilt was strong. Wonderful. Wonderful. I am grateful, Mr. Arian. He bent over the dog, and again I noticed the strange rolling of the strands of hair between his fingers. Have you been floating through the air, Venus? He murmured absently. The back of my neck prickled. What? What makes you say that? He turned his eyes up to me, those eyes with their unworldly depths. Well, I reckon she thinks she was floating while she was asleep. Just a funny feeling I had. Ah, yes. Well, um, right. I had a very funny feeling myself. You'd better take her home now and keep her quiet for the rest of the day. I was very thoughtful as I finished my tea. Floating. Floating. A fortnight later, I was again seated in Josh's barber's chair, bracing myself for the ordeal. To my alarm, he started straight in with the dread clippers. Usually, he began with the scissors and worked up gradually. But he was throwing me in at the deep end this time. In an attempt to alleviate the pain, I began to chatter with an edge of hysteria in my voice. How is a... Ow! Venus going on. Oh, fine. Fine. Josh smiled at me tenderly in the mirror. She was neither up nor down after that job. Well, oh, ah! I really didn't expect any trouble. As I said, it was, ah! Just a trifling thing. The barber whipped out another tuft with that inimitable flick of his. The thing in Mr. Harriet, it's a grand thing to have faith in your vet. I knew our little pet was in good hands. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Anderson. It's, ah, very nice to hear that. I was gratified, but that guilt feeling was still there. I got tired of trying to speak while watching my twitching features in the mirror, so I tried to concentrate on something else. It's a trick I adopt at the dentist's, and it doesn't work very well, but as the little man tugged away, I thought as hard as I could about my garden at Skeldell House. The lawns really did want mowing, and there were all those weeds to get at when I had a minute to spare. I had got round to considering whether it was time to put some fertiliser on my outdoor tomatoes when Josh laid down the clippers and lifted his scissors. I sighed and relaxed. The next part was only mildly uncomfortable. And who knows? He may have had the scissors sharpened since last time. My mind was wandering over the fascinating subject of tomatoes when the barber's voice pulled me back to reality. Mr. Harriet? He was twiddling away at a wisp of my hair with his fingers. I like gardening too. I almost jumped from the chair. That's remarkable. I was just thinking about my garden. I know. There was a faraway look in his eyes as he rolled and rolled with finger and thumb. It comes through the air, you know. Eh? Hey? Your thoughts. 
they come through to me. What? Yes. Just think about it. Them airs go right down into your head and they catch some of it from your brain and send it up to me. Oh, really? You're kidding me! I gave a loud laugh, which nevertheless had a hollow ring. Josh shook his head. I'm not joking nor jesting, Mr. Elliot. I've been at this game for nearly 40 years and it keeps happening to me. You'd be flabbergasted if I told you some of the thoughts that come up. Couldn't repeat them, I tell you. I slumped lower in my white sheet. Absolute rubbish and nonsense, of course. But I made a firm resolve never to think of Venus's anaesthetic during a haircut. Chapter 14 November the 1st, 1961 When I awoke in the morning, everything was wonderfully still. It was a blessed relief, because the previous night had been like all the others, and I was thrown about my bunk like a rag doll. I went up on deck and found we were anchored in the mouth of a river or inlet. A few hundred yards away I could see the Russian port of Kleidida. I couldn't believe the calm. Only a gentle swell rocked the ship. But half a mile back, the great sea waves still dashed themselves against the entrance to the harbour. Up on the bridge, I found the captain, pale and unshaven. He told me he had had a terrible job bringing the ship between the concrete walls at the entrance to the harbour. He had signalled repeatedly for a pilot, but none had come, and finally he was forced to bring the ship in himself. Doing this in the dark, in unfamiliar waters and during a storm, must have been a great strain. He said we were now waiting for a pilot to take us through the great concrete breakwaters to a berth at the quayside. At length, one arrived. A little stubbly-chinned man of about forty-five in a very Russian-looking overcoat, a couple of sizes too big for him, and a large peaked cap. He was very nervous as he guided us in. He kept hopping about the bridge, peering here and there, and then dashing to have a look over the ship's side. I was astonished to hear that he gave his commands in English. And it was strange to hear him cry, Starboard? And the big Dane at the wheel reply, Starboard? Then, Midships! Followed by the answering call, Midships? Up in the bows, the mate and a sailor were gazing down into the water and signalling back to the bridge, apparently testing the depth and looking for obstructions. To my untutored eyes, it seemed that the captain brought the ship in himself. He was, as always, calm and self-contained, and as we approached another ship or part of the breakwater, he would say, Perhaps a little astern, Mr. Pilot? Or, Post side, perhaps, Mr. Pilot? In a quiet voice, while the little man rushed about the bridge in a panic. On either side of the estuary, the banks were thickly clothed in pine trees, and further ahead I could see tenement buildings, and then the cranes and quays of the port. Once we had been moored by the quayside, I looked eagerly ashore, almost into the eyes of a young Russian soldier. There were two of them standing by the gangway of the Erish Clausen, and at least two guarding each of the other ships in the port. They all had automatic guns slung on their backs, and were wearing long greenish coats, crinkly Wellington-type boots, and furry hats turned up at the front and sides. Leaning over the rail of our little ship, I was only a few yards away from my soldier. I raised my hand and gave him a wave. Good morning, I cried cheerfully. His expression never changed. He looked back at me with a completely impassive, dead countenance. I moved along the rail and tried his colleague. Hello, I called, waving again. The response was exactly the same, a blank, unsmiling stare. Just then it started to rain, and they both reached back and pulled hoods over their heads. I felt it was not a happy start, and I looked past them at a sight which was not much more cheering. A network of railway lines with wagons a forest of huge cranes, and around the perimeter, tall watchtowers, each with its armed soldier looking down at us. Beyond the port itself rose an assortment of dilapidated houses. Clydida is, of course, the old Lithuanian port of Memel, and I had previously read that when the Russians took over, a proportion of the native population was deported and replaced by Russians. I was unable to ascertain the extent of this, and since Clydida is now part of the Soviet Union, I shall refer to all the people I met as Russians. Very soon a large number of officials came aboard and I was relieved to find that they were cheerful and smiling. There was much shaking of hands and loud laughter and everybody addressed me as Doctor in a guttural tone with the accent on the second syllable. Most of them were from the Customs and Immigration Authorities 
and among them were several young women, one of whom spoke very good English. In fact, nearly all of them seemed to be able to get along in English. The other language in which they conversed with the captain was German. The exception in this merry company was a tall, lugubrious sanitary inspector wearing breeches and a cowboy hat. I had to go down into the hold with him, where he looked around him sadly but said nothing. Immediately afterwards, a little fat woman beckoned me to accompany her to where the animal's food was kept. There were several tons of this surplus, and it was all to be left for the Russians free of charge. But it seemed that they suspected some catch in this, because to my astonishment, the little woman began to slash open the bags of super-quality sheep nuts and the bales of sweet hay. She pushed her hand into the centre of each bag and bale and dropped some of the contents into a series of polythene bags. Apparently, these samples had to go to a laboratory to be examined before they would accept the food. I went back up to the captain's room where the officials were still signing forms and smoking and drinking. They had been joined by the chief of Safrat, which deals with the incoming and outgoing cargoes, and, like the others, he was polite, friendly, and ready to roar with laughter at the slightest excuse. I was interested in the dress of these men, who were obviously important people. They all wore smartly cut dark suits, and some had greenish gabardine mackintoshes. But the materials of their clothes looked cheap and shoddy. Still, they were trim and neatly turned out, though the whole effect was spoiled by the fact that every man sported an abominable off-white tweedy cloth cap pulled right down to his ears. This was clearly the fashion in these parts, but to me the result was truly ghastly. However, they were very pleasant, and I found their conversation fascinating. One thing which struck me forcibly was their tremendous willingness to work and their desire to learn. They told me that most of them had begun as factory workers, but had studied at night and in every available moment to rise to their present positions. Of course, all the time, I was anxiously awaiting the veterinary examination of the sheep. The veterinary surgeon turned out to be a little fat woman, very like the one who had inspected the food. Unlike the officials, she could not speak a word of English, but she marched up to me, tapped her chest and said, Doctor! As we shook hands as colleagues, she burst into an infectious, bubbling laugh. She had a helper with her, a big, tough-looking chap in blue dungarees, and we all went down to the hole together. I was intrigued by her method of examining the sheep. The man penned five animals in a corner while she opened a little bag and took out a whole bunch of thermometers. These were strange-looking flat things with centigrade markings, and attached to each was a piece of string with a clip on the end. She methodically dipped each nozzle in a jar of Vaseline before inserting it in the rectum and clipping the string to the wool. Then she stood looking at her watch for what seemed an age. Finally, she removed the thermometers and took the readings. After that, she had another five caught, and again we had the lengthy wait, and the reading, before moving to another pen. The realisation burst on me with a sense of shock that these were two-minute thermometers, unlike our half-minute ones, and also that she was going to examine ten sheep in every pen. This was going to take an awful long time. Gallantly holding her jar of Vaseline, I tried to alleviate the boredom by making conversation. It was difficult, since neither of us spoke a word of the other's language, but I managed to get over to her that most of the sheep were of the Romney Marsh breed. This appeared to delight her, because thereafter, whenever she pushed the thermometer up a sheep's rectum, she would cry, Romney Marsh! and laugh happily. Then on to the next one, and again the thrust of the thermometer, and the joyous, Romney Marsh! It lightened the proceedings to a certain extent, but after an hour and a half we had covered only one side of the tween deck's hold, about a quarter of the sheep, and I quailed at the thought of another four and a half hours of this. But there was no doubt she was a pleasant little woman. She was dressed in a cheap-looking navy blue raincoat and the kind of velour hat you see in jumble sales in England, and her chubby face never stopped smiling. The only time she looked serious was when she heard a cough from one of the Lincolns. It was the moment I had been dreading, and she turned to me questioningly. Ah, 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 she said in a fair imitation of the parasitic bark and raised her eyebrows. I shrugged my shoulders. What could I do? How could I explain? 
The animal's temperature was normal and she appeared reassured. But some time later another sheep coughed. Ah, 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 she asked, and again I shrugged and gave a non-committal smile. About halfway through we were joined by another vet, obviously the little woman's superior. He was very well dressed in dark overcoat and black trilby, and his handsome, high cheekboned Asiatic face radiated charm as he shook my hand and thumped me on the back. Salam alaikum, he said, somewhat to my surprise. He too spoke no English, and when he heard the cough, he swung round on me. Aha, 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 he inquired. I spread my hands and shook my head, and he laughed suddenly. He seemed a happy go lucky fellow and was clearly in a hurry to be off. He waved goodbye to his colleague, shook my hand warmly and smiled, then he strode from the hold. I was still baffled by the Oriental greeting and turned to the little woman. Salam alaikum, Irkutsk, Tata, she replied. I realised that he came from the other end of this vast country, and to let her know I understood, I pulled the corners of my eyes outwards. She burst into a high-pitched giggle. She did love to laugh. But the strain of hanging around with the pot of Vaseline was beginning to tell. I tried to get rid of the tension by saying things like, Look, this is driving me right up the bloody wall. At which she would give me a nod and a sweet, uncomprehending smile, but at last I could stand it no longer. I gave her back the Vaseline and fled to the sanctuary of my cabin. I heard later that it took her five hours to get round the sheep. The unloading berth was occupied by another ship, the Ubergen, which was discharging a cargo of cattle and taking on a lot of little cob-like horses, so we could not start our unloading until she moved. My immediate ambition was to get ashore, but the customs and immigration people had taken our passports, and until they came back nobody could leave the ship. When the passports were returned, I looked around for a companion because John Crooks had warned me not to go ashore alone. The mate and engineer would not budge, as they were worried about relations between Denmark and Russia following an attack on the Scandinavian countries by Khrushchev, which they had heard on the radio in the Danish news. In fact, as I went around, it soon became obvious that none of the ship's company had any intention of going ashore. It was the captain, gentlemanly as always, who stepped in. He could see that I was disappointed and said that if I gave him a few minutes to wash and change, he would come with me. As I waited on the deck, the daylight faded rapidly to dusk and lights began to appear in the tenements beyond the port. They all seemed like forty-watt bulbs and the general effect was dreary in the extreme. By the time the captain was ready, it was quite dark. I had been strongly advised by the man from Saufrat to visit the seamen's club called Interclub, and I decided to do this and leave the exploration of the town until tomorrow. We went down the gangway, showed our passports to the soldiers, and I took my first step onto Russian soil. I said, Interclub? And the soldiers pointed vaguely along the railway lines into the distance. They still preserved the deadpan look I had seen this morning, and it struck me that they were just about the only unsmiling Russians I had met all day. I wondered why they acted so very differently. There were floodlights shining down from the cranes, and we began to pick our way along by their light. But it was slow going. We were in a maze of sheds, cranes and wagons, and the quayside seemed to stretch indefinitely ahead. I soon became impatient. Look, I said to the captain, the town's just over there. I pointed to the high fence which surrounded the harbour. Surely there's a gate of some kind here? The captain shook his head. I think not. There will be a gatehouse somewhere along at the end. We must go through there. Now, I believe I am fundamentally a fairly solid citizen, but every now and then I do something daft. This was one of those times. I decided to look for a shortcut. I groped my way into the darkness behind a row of wagons, and I was studying the dim silhouette of the fence, when suddenly an enormous dog shot out at me from the gloom. It was of an Alsatian type, and it came at me with a terrifying baying sound. I caught a glimpse of a snarling mouth and white teeth, but I didn't wait to make a closer examination. I took off at great speed, but after a few yards I tripped over a railway line and fell flat on my face. At that moment I was sure it was all over with me. I'm not going to suggest that my past life flashed before my eyes, but in that second or two I did have a vivid impression of the incongruity of my situation. I, James Herriot, Yorkshire Dale's veterinary surgeon and dog lover, 
meeting my end by being torn to pieces by a dog behind a railway wagon on a dark night in Russia. I was waiting for the first crunch when I heard the animal twang to a stop at the end of its chain. And as I looked back, I could see it fighting to get at me, the great teeth gleaming in the floodlights about six inches from my leg. I scrabbled along on my stomach to where the captain was waiting. That usually calm man was visibly shaken, and he helped me up, gripped my arm, and hurried me along the road we had first taken. As I struggled to regain my breath, I felt I had learnt my first lesson. Do not go nosing about in dark places in Russia. Keep to the proper path. When we came to the gatehouse, I had to smile to myself. My nerves were still vibrating after my encounter with that creature back there. But when I saw the groups of soldiers around the brightly lit room, and more soldiers behind a sliding window carrying out interminable hard-eyed scrutiny of our passports and ourselves, the absurdity of my idea of a shortcut was forced on me. Before passing through, I took a last glance at the long stretch of quayside behind us, and I wondered how many more four-legged killers were lurking in the shadows under the fence. Once in the street, we asked a young fellow in the inevitable light cloth cap about interclub, and he politely marched us to the door before shaking hands and leaving us. Inside, we found a very comfortable, even mildly luxurious club. Russian time is two hours ahead of ours, so most of the activities had ceased for the night. But nevertheless, the little man in charge was effusive in his welcome. The captain spoke to him in German and told him who we were, and he kept bowing and smiling as though we were his long-lost brothers. He insisted on taking us on a tour of the establishment and ushered us into each room with a deferential, Please, please, a common and much-used word among the people I have met here. There was a little cinema dance hall, bar, and a billiard room where some young German sailors were knocking balls about. We saw several cosy lounges, in one of which a large radio was giving a commentary on Tottenham Hotspur in the European Cup. Our guide led us into a library and reading room, where there were newspapers in all languages, and I hastened to the English section, hoping to catch up with some of the latest news. However, I found only a pile of the Daily Worker, and the most recent was a fortnight old. I was moodily reading about the long-past England versus Wales football match when the little man bustled up all smiles and began to load me with a huge quantity of books and pamphlets, all in English. These books were all beautifully produced, and one of them, Khrushchev and the USA, would be very expensive to buy in England. I was also presented with a roll of cine film of the same visit and a little badge which I kept for Rosie. We left on a wave of cordiality, and as I came out into the night and looked at the gaunt tenements nearby, it struck me how sharply they contrasted with that club. That night, as I completed my journal, two thoughts were uppermost in my mind. First, my bed would keep still for a change. And second, it had been an eventful day. Chapter 15 This is Amber, Sister Rose said. The one I wanted you to examine... I looked at the pale, almost honey-coloured shading of the hair on the dog's ears and flanks. I can see why you've given her that name. I bet she'd really glow in the sunshine. The nurse laughed. Yes. Funny enough, it was sunny when I first saw her, and the name just jumped into my mind. She gave me a sideways glance. I'm good at names, as you know. Oh, yes. Without a doubt, I said, smiling. It was a little joke between us. Sister Rose had to be good at christening the endless stream of unwanted animals which passed through the little dog sanctuary which lay behind her house and which she ran and maintained by organising small shows, jumble sales, etc., and by spending her own money. And she didn't only give her money. She also gave her precious time because, as a nursing sister, she led a full life of service to the human race. I often ask myself how she found the time to fight for the animals too. It was a mystery to me but I admired her. Where did this one come from? I asked. Sister Rose shrugged. Oh, found wandering in the streets of Hebbleton. Nobody knows her and there have been no inquiries to the police. Obviously abandoned. I felt the old tightening of anger in my throat. How could they do this to such a beautiful dog? Just turn it away to fend for itself. Oh, people like that have some astonishing reasons. In this case, I think it's because Amber has a little skin disease. Perhaps it frightened them. They could at least have taken her to a vet, I grunted as I opened the door of the pen. I noticed some bare patches round the toes, 
and as I knelt and examined the feet, Amber nuzzled my cheek and wagged her tail. I looked up at her, at the flopping ears, the pronounced jowls, and the trusting eyes which had been betrayed. It's a hound's face, I said, but how about the rest of her? What breed would you call her? Sister Rose laughed. Oh, she's a puzzle. I get a lot of practice at guessing, but this one beats me. I wondered if a foxhound had gone astray and mated with something like a Labrador or Dalmatian, but I don't know. I didn't know either. The body, dappled with patches of brown, black and white, was the wrong shape for a hound. She had very large feet, a long thin tail in constant motion, and everywhere on her coat the delicate sheen of gold. Well, I said, whatever she is, she's a bonny one, and good-natured too. Oh, yes, she's a darling. We'll have no difficulty in finding a home for her. She's the perfect pet. How old do you think she is? I smiled. You can never tell for sure, but she's got a juvenile look about her. I opened the mouth and looked at the rows of untainted teeth. I'd say nine or ten months. She's just a big pup. That's what I thought. She'll be really large when she reaches full size. As if to prove the sister's words, the young bitch reared up and planted her forefeet on my chest. I looked again at the laughing mouth and those eyes. Amber, I said, I really like you. Oh, I'm so glad, Sister Rose said. We must get this skin trouble cleared up as quickly as possible and then I can start finding her a home. It's just a bit of eczema, isn't it? Probably. Probably I see there's some bareness around the eyes and cheeks, too. Skin diseases in dogs, as in humans, are tricky things, often baffling in origin and difficult to cure. I fingered the hairless areas. I didn't like the combination of feet and face, but the skin was dry and sound. Maybe it was nothing much. I banished to the back of my mind a spectre which appeared for a brief instant. I didn't want to think of that, and I had no intention of worrying Sister Rose. She had enough on her mind. Yes, probably eczema, I said briskly. Rub this ointment well into the parts night and morning. I handed over the box of zinc oxide and lanolin. A bit old-fashioned, maybe. But it has served me well for a few years, and ought to do the trick in combination with the nurse's good feeding. When two weeks passed without news of Amber, I was relieved. I was happy, too, at the thought that she would now be in a good home among people who appreciated her. I was brought back to reality with a bump when Sister Rose phoned one morning. Mr. Harriet, those bare patches aren't any better. In fact, they're spreading. Spreading? Where? Up her legs and on her face. The spectre leapt up, mouthing and gesticulating. Oh, not that, please. I'll come right out, Sister, I said, and on my way to the car I picked up the microscope. Amber greeted me as she had before, with dancing eyes and lashing tail, but I felt sick when I saw the ragged denudation of the face and the naked skin staring at me on the legs. I got hold of the young animal and held her close, sniffing at the hairless areas. Sister Rose looked at me in surprise. What are you doing? Trying to detect a mousy smell. Mousy smell? And is it there? Yes. And what does that mean? Mange. Oh, dear. The nurse put a hand to her mouth. That's rather nasty, isn't it? Then she put her shoulders back in a characteristic gesture. Well, I've had experience of mange before and I can tackle it. I've always been able to clear it up with sulphur baths. But there's such a danger of infection to the other dogs. It really is a worry. I put Amber down and stood up, feeling suddenly weary. Yes, but you're thinking of sarcoptic mange, sister. I'm afraid this is something rather worse. Worse? In what way? Well, the whole look of the thing suggests demodectic mange. She nodded. I've heard of that, and it's more serious. Yes. I may as well bite the bullet. Very often incurable. Goodness me, I had no idea. She wasn't scratching much, so I didn't worry. Yes, that's just it, I said wryly. Dogs scratch almost non-stop with sarcoptic mange, and we can cure it, but they often show only mild discomfort with demodectic, which usually defeats us. The spectre was very large in my mind now, and I used the word literally, because this skin disease had haunted me ever since I had qualified. 
I had seen many fine dogs put to sleep after the most prolonged attempts to treat them. I lifted the microscope from the back of the car. Anyway, I may be jumping the gun. I hope I am. This is the only way to find out. There was a patch on Amber's left foreleg which I squeezed and scraped with a scalpel blade. I deposited the debris and serum on a glass slide, added a few drops of potassium hydroxide and put a cover slip on top. Sister Rose gave me a cup of coffee while I waited. Then I rigged up the microscope in the light from the kitchen window and looked down the eyepiece. And there it was. My stomach tightened as I saw what I didn't want to see. The dread mite. Demodex carnis. The head, the thorax with its eight stumpy legs and the long cigar-shaped body. And there wasn't just one. The whole microscopic field was teeming with them. Ah, oh, well, that's it, sister, I said. There's no doubt about it. I'm very sorry. The corners of her mouth drooped. But... but isn't there anything we can do? Oh, yes, we can try. And we're going to try like anything, because I've taken a fancy to Amber. Don't worry too much. I've cured a few Demodex cases in my time, always by using the same stuff. I went to the car and fished around in the boot. Here it is. Odilon. I held up the can in front of her. I'll show you how to apply it. It was difficult to rub the lotion into the affected patches as Amber wagged and licked, but I finished at last. Now, do that every day, I said, and let me know in about a week. Sometime that Odilon really does work. Sister Rose stuck out her jaw with the determination which had saved so many animals. I assure you I'll do it most carefully. I'm sure we can succeed. It doesn't look so bad. I didn't say anything, and she went on. But how about my other dogs? Won't they become infected? I shook my head. Another odd thing about Demodex. It very rarely spreads to another animal. It is nothing like as contagious as the sarcops, so you have very little cause for worry in that way. Well, that's something anyway. But how on earth does a dog get the disease in the first place? Mysterious again, I said. The veterinary profession are pretty well convinced that all dogs have a certain number of Demodex mites in their skin, but why they should cause mange in some and not in others has never been explained. Heredity has got something to do with it because it sometimes occurs in several dogs in the same litter, but it's a baffling business. I left Sister Rose with her can of Odilon. Maybe this would be one of the exceptions to my experiences with this condition. I had to hope so. I heard from the nurse within a week. She had been applying the Odolin religiously, but the disease was spreading further up the legs. I hurried out there and my fears were confirmed when I saw Amber's face. It was disfigured by the increasing hairlessness. And when I thought of the beauty which had captivated me on my first visit, the sight was like a blow. Her tail-wagging cheerfulness was undiminished, and that seemed to make the whole thing worse. I had to try something else. And in view of the fact that a secondary subcutaneous invasion of staphylococci was an impediment to recovery, I gave the dog an injection of staph toxoid. I also started her on a course of Fowler's solution of arsenic, which at that time was popular in the treatment of skin conditions. When ten days passed, I had begun to hope, and it was a bitter disappointment when Sister Rose telephoned just after breakfast. Her voice trembled as she spoke. Mr. Harriet... She really is deteriorating all the time. Nothing seems to do any good. I'm beginning to think that... I cut her off in mid-sentence. All right, I'll be out there within an hour. Don't give up hope yet. These cases sometimes take months to recover. I knew as I drove to the sanctuary that my words were only meant to comfort. They had no real substance. But I had tried to say something helpful because there was nothing Sister Rose hated more than putting a dog to sleep. Of all the hundreds of animals which had passed through her hands, I could remember only a handful which had defeated her. Very old dogs with chronic kidney or heart conditions which were in a hopeless plight, or young ones with distemper. With all the others, she had battled until they were fit to go to their new homes. And it wasn't only Sister Rose. I myself recoiled from the idea of doing such a thing to Amber. There was something about that dog which had taken hold of me. When I arrived, I still had no idea what I was going to do, and when I spoke, I was half surprised at the things I said. Sister, I've come to take Amber home with me. 
I'll be able to treat her myself every day then. You've got enough to do looking after your other dogs. I know you have done everything possible, but I'm going to take on this job myself. But you're a busy man. How will you find the time? I can treat her in the evenings and any other spare moments. This way I'll be able to check on her progress all the time. I'm determined to get her right. And driving back to the surgery, I was surprised at the depth of my feeling. Throughout my career, I have often had this compulsive desire to cure an animal, but never stronger than with Amber. The young bitch was delighted to be in the car with me. Like everything else, she seemed to regard this as just another game, and she capered around, licking my ear, resting her paws on the dash, and peering through the windscreen. I looked at her happy face, scarred by the disease and smeared with oliden, and thumped my hand on the wheel. Demodectic mange was hell, but this was one case which was going to get better. It was the beginning of a strangely vivid episode in my life, as fresh now as it was then, more than thirty years ago. We had no facilities for boarding dogs. Very few vets had at that time, but I made up a comfortable billet for her in the old stable in the yard. I penned off one of the stalls with a sheet of plywood and put down a bed of straw. Despite its age, the stable was a substantial building and free from drafts. She would be snug in there. I made sure of one thing. I kept Helen out of the whole business. I remembered how stricken she had been when we adopted Oscar the cat and then lost him to his rightful owner, and I knew she would soon grow too fond of this dog. But I had forgotten about myself. Veterinary surgeons would never last in their profession if they became too involved with their patients. I knew from experience that most of my colleagues were just as sentimental over animals as the owners, but before I knew what was happening I became involved with Amber. I fed her myself, changed her bedding and carried out the treatment. I saw her as often as possible during the day, but when I think of her now, it is always night. It was late November when darkness came in soon after four o'clock, and the last few visits were a dim-sighted fumbling in cow buyers, and when I came home, I always drove round to the yard at the back of Scaledale House and trained my headlights on the stable. Thank you for listening to our audiobooks. We do our best to regularly upload quality books with clear narrations. Please subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell icon so we can bring you more great books. Thank you very much and we hope you enjoyed listening to your audiobook.